Come on, somebody help me. Can we give a big round of applause? It's Resurrection Sunday. Come on, everybody. He is alive. He is risen. That's what we're here to celebrate. Amen, amen. Good crowd this morning. I'm already all excited. I haven't even started. Let me... Calm down, David. Pace yourself. Uh, my name is Pastor David Mendoza. I'm the campus pastor here at the Family Church Westico Campus. Pleasure to be here once again with you guys on this beautiful Resurrection Sunday. Wonderful time for us to remember why we're here. We're here because the King is risen. We serve a living God. We don't serve a dead God or a dead religion. We have a relationship. If you don't know me at all, maybe you're visiting for the first time. I am a big Jesus guy. That's what I'm about. Like, I'm not about religion. I'm not about all these different things. I love Jesus, and I believe that in Jesus, there is the power to transform your life, our lives, our family's lives, our environment, because Jesus is risen. Amen? Amen. I have a uh, scripture for you guys. If you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to get right into the Word. You guys are all looking nice. Woo! Easter best. <laughs> Uh, make sure you hit that photo booth later because you want to remember the picture, how nice everybody looks. Not everybody dresses up every day, so take a picture. It will last longer, right? Uh, go with me to Matthew 27, verses 57 through 61. I'm just going to walk through the resurrection story with you guys, and I pray that uh, your hearts be open, your, hearts be, your, 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 soul be, your spirit be pliable to kind of receive this, and I believe God has a word for everybody here today. If you're here today, uh, first-time visitor or not, we believe that you're here for a reason. We truly, truly believe. That's why we do what we do. We do this 52 weeks out of the year. We're constantly preaching Jesus. We're constantly doing church together. But we believe that in the power of a moment, when we stand before our God, in a moment, God can transform everything. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, verse 57 says this. As evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea, who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate issued an order to release it to him. Uh, Joseph took the body and wrapped it up in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb, which had been carved out of the rock, and then he rolled a great stone across the entrance and left. This is the part that I really got caught on, and I hope that you can follow me in the scripture today, this last verse. Both Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting across from the tomb watching while this happened, okay? So I'd like to speak to you out of the topic today. uh, I'd like to title today's sermon... Empty graves and warm welcomes. Empty graves and warm welcomes. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, thank you once again for the opportunity to be here, Dad. I thank you for this time together. I thank you for worship, for friendship, for fellowship, for a community of believers, Dad. I pray that we have soft hearts, pliable spirits to receive your word this morning, Father, that we can be transformed by it, get to know you in a very real way, and that this not be another Easter service, but that it be a moment in our lives where we encounter a greater truth. Thank you for who you are. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. Uh, how many of you guys remember this, this uh, question when you were younger, maybe? Maybe you were in kindergarten. By the way, we have kids with us today. We want to welcome all our youth Ignite here with us. We have students here in the house. We love you guys. <laughs> You're going to know why I said that in a minute. But if, if any of you remember, when you were younger, they asked you this, whether in school, maybe in elementary or something, they said, what do you want to be when you grow up? Does anybody remember this question? Uh, show of hands. Just... <laughs> I hope this doesn't get too crazy. Show of hands, how many of you did exactly what you said you were going to do in elementary school? One, all right, one person, one one or two people, yeah. Everybody else was like, no, I didn't quite make it into the NBA because I'm Hispanic and short. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I thought I was going to be a ninja, but apparently ninjas aren't in high demand nowadays, so I became an accountant instead, right? Uh, If you're anything like me, I actually wanted to be like, uh, I can draw, I wanted to be like an illustrator. But somewhere along the line, I actually became an accountant. No, no. I always pause for applause, but it never gets it. It's just like, oh, you're an accountant? I was an accountant. Now I'm a full-time pastor. Which, again, like I didn't. (laughs) Also, not on my list. Like, I wasn't on my list. I think it was astronaut, ninja, and then something else. Uh, Not accountant or pastor. And uh, it's funny because life is like that, right? I mean, if you're a child in the the room today and you're a teenager, I don't want to get too dark with you guys. With Christ, anything is possible. With Christ, anything is possible, especially with you guys who are young, who are in here right now and have plans and aspirations for where you want to go with your life. Man, if you have God, anything is possible. But today I also want to talk a little bit to the people in the room who are like me and who had a plan for their life and the life didn't work out exactly like they wanted. Uh, Maybe you were 
your goal was to become a, a, some sort of police officer or some sort of job or some sort of career, and it didn't quite happen that way. I, I want to kind of talk about what happens when, if we're not careful, we have plans for our life, and our life doesn't work out the way we want it to, so our hope can be affected. Our hope can be affected. Now, in the story that I just told you about, there's two Marys, Mary Magdalene and the other one, which I think is kind of like, why don't they give us her last name? I don't know. The other Mary. They're from the valley. There's a bunch of them. The other one, right? The other Maria. <laughs> and uh, these two ladies are, are, are sitting there, and for some reason, this, this, this vision, this illustration kind of struck me. They're sitting there watching the tomb of Jesus be sealed up. You know, what must it have been like to be those women who had seen Jesus move in amazing, amazing ways. You know, before this, for a few years, Jesus was doing his thing, man. He was just raising people from the dead. He was healing people. He was walking the earth and just kind of saying, no, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. Our God loves us, and because I'm here, I'm going to give you a new way to do life. Amen? People were like, wow, this is amazing. And he was multiplying food and just the heal, healing the people who couldn't walk. I mean, he was doing an amazing, amazing ministry. And these people must have thought, Wow, I'm following him. He's amazing. If I can attach myself to Jesus, my life is going to be transformed. Now, Friday came. In the span of 72 hours, everything fell apart. Friday morning, they took him. By Friday afternoon, he was dead. And then all of a sudden, they're thinking, wait, I thought my life was going to be a certain way. And, and now here they are sitting across from the tomb of the man that they put all their hope in as they put him into the grave. What must that have felt like? I can imagine that it felt a little like us. I think sometimes when we're a little bit younger, if you're anything like me, you know, when you're younger, life is full of open doors. What do I mean by that? I mean that when you're younger, there really is no limit to what you can do. When you ask a kid, what can you be? They really believe with all their heart that they can be anything. Amen? When you get older, it gets tricky, right? Some of you guys are here and you're thinking like, when I was younger, I wanted to have money. I didn't want to be like super rich because, you know, I keep it, I'm humble. I keep it real, right? I don't want to be super rich, but I want to be comfortable, right? I, I want to be educated, perhaps. I want to have a two-car garage, maybe a home, nice home with a nice piece of property on it. I want to have the, the big, nice American family, which is like a husband, a wife, and 2.5 kids, right? <laughs> I, I want to have all this, and I want to kind of do that. That's what I was hoping for my life. Maybe you're in the house today, and I want to talk to specifically some people who I think God wants to minister to today. We have hopes for our lives, but then our life kind of turns out different, doesn't it? You might be thinking, well, I wanted to be educated, but I made a couple of missteps growing up, and I don't quite have the education that I wanted. I wanted to get a soulmate who would, you know, my one and only. By the way, there is no such thing. <laughs> oh, everybody, like, oh, boo, it totally wrecked my life. If you do the math, it doesn't make any sense. If there's only one person for everybody, and you married the wrong one, you blew it for everybody. Because yours belong to somebody else. You know what I mean? No, do the math. It's, it's really bad. Like, no. <laughs> like, I got off on a tangent. That one's free. <laughs> I want somebody in my life, I'll get rid of the word soulmate, who just, you know, completes me, takes me as I am, and loves me who I, for who I am. Chaparro, gordo, whatever. Just loves me, you know. I want, them to, I want, them, I want to feel loved. So I want, I want finance. I want, I want health. I want my body to never fall apart. But Taco Tuesday comes once a week, people. <laughs> Every week. <laughs> That's 52 Taco Tuesdays a year. <laughs> and we start, you know, our body doesn't quite respond like it used to. And all of a sudden, we get bulges and creaking and cracking and stuff. And... But when we were younger, that wasn't the case. When we were younger, we could do anything. Life is interesting because as you, as, when you were younger, it was all about open door. You could pretty much decide to do something. And if you just tried hard enough, you could do it, right? But then we get older. And all of a sudden, we wanted to be rich, but, and I'm not talking about later, I'm not talking about last week, I'm talking about right now. You are actively struggling to make ends meet. You just, it's hard, right? It's hard. Maybe you wanted a wife, a, a husband, who would just love you for who you are, and you would think that when they came, they would fix you. The funny thing is, they thought the same thing about you. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, that person that you were looking for to be married to, to, to complete you, to be your partner, came and went. And the plans that we had for our life can kind of shift, right? 
We wanted a house. Maybe you, you've always wanted a house. Maybe you grew up in, in, in a hum, from humble beginnings and you wanted a nice big home because everybody has big homes nowadays and you, you want a nice big home and you want to get a two-car garage and you never got that. You're still renting. And you're thinking, like, this isn't exactly how I planned this to be. The reason why I want to talk about this kind of thing is because I find for today's lesson and for today's time together with you, I want to, I want to talk about something. When life doesn't quite line up the way we want it to, in relationship, and finance, and even just in anything that you can imagine, we tend to lose hope. We get into this little habit of like, well, I guess I wasn't supposed to have that. Well, I guess I'm not supposed to be loved like that. I guess I'm going to be winging it by myself for a while. I guess I'll struggle financially pretty much for the rest of my life because this is what life is. So you see how we had aspirations and hopes for ourselves, and then life kind of kind of sucker punches you, right? And it does its thing, and all of a sudden you find yourself looking at your life and thinking, like, I didn't quite sign up for all this. I thought it was going to be different. This is what I call a natural ending. A natural ending. Things can come to your life that you were hoping for, and it looks in the natural like they're not possible anymore. I can't have that anymore. The way I describe it in the story, and the reason why I have this illustration up here is because just like the ladies in the story, they believed that Jesus was going to be something, and right there where they were sitting in, in chapter 27, the, the tomb was rolled away and covered up their hope and dream. You see that? Let me give you a quick definition of hope so you have an idea of what I mean by hope, because hope is super important in our life. Go ahead and bring it up. Hope is an expectation or belief in the fulfillment of something desired, a belief or an expectation that something will happen. Hope is very important for humans, for us. I don't know about dogs. (laughs) It's a joke, sorry. (laughs) Get it, like humans, I don't know about aliens, but we need hope. Hope is like air in our lungs. If you live life without hope, you wake up in the morning looking forward to really nothing, looking forward to just kind of having another day, working another job, making another buck, putting up with another family member or whatever, and you kind of just live life without really much direction. You're just kind of living it. Life without hope is hard. I believe that we're supposed to wake up in the morning and have an expectation and a belief of where we're supposed to be. But I don't want to get there so fast. I really want to spend some time here. Because when I was preparing this lesson, I felt that the Lord in his wisdom and in his knowledge today, this is how specific I am. This is how I think. I felt that today on Easter Sunday, somehow there's going to be people coming to this service who needed to hear this word. And the word is that you had a hope or an expectation of what life was going to be like, and it feels like the door closed on you. And all of a sudden, you find living your life saying, I, I wanted that, but I can't have it now because life has been difficult to me. Does that make sense? So it kind of looks like this, and this is a visual that I got when I was preparing this sermon. I hope you can connect with this. This is super important for me. I hope you can connect. I got the illustration that there's people in the house who maybe hoped, I'll give you an example, to feel loved by somebody else. They wanted to find that person that would just kind of complete them, right? And then life got hard, and, and, and you didn't realize marriage was so hard, and all of a sudden that person came and went. And now it looks like, well, who's going to love me? Who's going to be a part of my family? And it looks like the door is closed. You're saying, well, that relationship is dead. I guess I'm going to be by myself for a while. And this is the image that I got. And you can pretty much plug anything in into this, because I think this is where some of us find ourselves. As a pastor, I have the privilege of hearing a lot of stories. It is an honor and a blessing to be able to pastor this congregation. (laughs) I love you guys. I love being in the Mid-Valley. I I really do. But because I'm your pastor, I feel the weight a lot of time of, of closed doors, of hope lost, a family member lost, a, a relative lost, a relationship lost, a financial loss, and people come to me and, they, and I can sense it on them. It's a weight. They feel like they can't do that anymore. What they had is gone, and their life is this new reality for them. So the, the, the image that I got in my head, and this is why I brought this on stage today, is I got the image of like people hoping that the door would eventually open up again. Whether it be in relationship or in finance or whatever it is, you you hope, you you just wish the opportunity was the same as it used to be. You you hope you had a do-over, right? I wish I could do that over again. I wouldn't make the same mistakes that I did. I wish I could do it over again. I wish I wouldn't have signed up for that credit card at 18, right? (laughs) Because you thought you knew what you were doing, but you did not. You know, I wish I would have treated that person differently. 
So you come, you come up to this door and you just kind of feel the weight of it. And you say, okay, that's, that door's closed. I can't have that. I messed that up. And then you live your life. But here's the, what I'm getting at. I find that a lot of times the people that I talk to in the community and in the congregation, they, 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 they are moving on with their life, but it's almost as if occasionally they come back and they just kind of check it. Okay, yep, yep, I'm still alone. Yep, I, I, I still have all that debt. Yeah, yeah, it's still there. Oh, is it going to open? Wait, let me... Okay, no, no. I'm still, I still have, my parents still have not forgiven me. I have still not forgiven them. And then we, li- and we live. We live according to us, right? We live. Oh, we've got to get to work. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. We've got to raise our kids. We've got to pay the bills. We've got to, got to play the rat race. We've got to do things. And then, okay, occasionally, let me just check real quick. Oh, nope, nope. I haven't forgiven them. <laughs> that door is still closed. You see that? And before I move on, I really want to hammer this home. We're not meant to stand before closed doors with regret. This is why I did this, all for this moment. We're not meant to stand here hoping it would open, living in regret. We're supposed to be full of hope. The ladies in the story, the Marys, must have thought to themselves, like, man, like, that was unexpected. <laughs> Jesus is dead, and we thought he was the one. But I guess this is our life now. We just have to move on without it. Or do we? Or do we, right? <laughs> just keep on going. Go back with me to Matthew. Our life can look like it has natural lendings, but let's, let's, go, let's see what happens in Matthew. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, the Marys, right, <laughs> uh, went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. When you sit on something, you're in charge. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you, if, if you were to like just sit on a chair, that chair you're in charge of the chair. Like if, if, you're, if you're being bullied and you grab the other bully and you throw him to the ground, you sit on him like you're fine. Like you're in charge. You won, Right. Look, this is a complete sign of dominance. Uh, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Verse 3, his appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for, uh, for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed, verse 8, quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Real quick reality check, church. We're here because Jesus is actually alive. Let's never forget that on this Resurrection Sunday, we're here celebrating a tremendous miracle. This isn't a religion thing. This isn't a pastor thing. This isn't a thou shalt not do, thou shalt will, whatever. This has to do with the fact that a man came and said that he was the son of God. And if we followed him, we would have peace with God. And we would have our eternity secure and our present alive in Christ. And he said, if you believe in me, listen, if you believe in me, I will do all this for you. And if you, just in case you doubt, just in case you doubt, I'm going to physically die in your place. Physically. And then I will physically rise again. And this is what we're here to celebrate. This has nothing to do with religion. This has nothing to do with just checking the Easter box. This has everything to do with that there was a man who is alive. And because he lives, we can live. This is what we're here to do. There was a heavenly... In the scripture, it's super clear. The Marys are going to there and they're probably thinking like, okay, well... The Sabbath was yesterday. We couldn't properly prepare Jesus' body because it was the Sabbath. Let's go in there. Let's get some spices. He's dead. Let's go in there and prepare his body because, you know, our hopes and dreams have gone. And as we're getting there, the earth shakes. This This is the kind of miracle we're celebrating today. The earth shakes. The grave is open. There was, there was guards there. The guards were just there like this. And then all of a sudden, I don't even know what the scripture says. They were as if dead men. Basically means they passed out or they ran or both. Like, they were just gone. Like, those guys that were there to watch the grave, gone. Angel shows up, knocks over the, the closed grave, and sits on it. And then when they get there, the dazzling angel is just kind of sitting there. See, I want to talk about natural endings and about things that might appear to you to be closed. But I also want to talk about, you, about the fact that we're here to celebrate a heavenly intervention. 
a heavenly intervention, which basically means something from above came and said, what is closed does not have to remain closed. What is closed and what you think is an end is actually only a beginning. This is what the angel showed up to say. Now, the lady saw him, must have freaked out, and the angel said, look, go in there and check. You, want, you came to see Jesus? Go in there and check and see if he's still there. I can imagine the ladies were like, okay, <laughs> nice angel, right? Because <laughs> they, they were fearful. I mean, it was, it was glowing. And they get there, and the grave that was closed, that appeared to be an ending, was now open. And the body was no longer in there. So he says, okay, look for yourself. It's not, it's empty. Jesus is alive. See, what if, church, what if today on this Easter, the things that you thought had ended have not? The things that you thought you could no longer have in your life because of past mistakes, because of past hurts, because of past hang-ups are still available to you because he is alive. What if you have not lost your hope and you can have your hope again? See, this is so important for today's lesson. I really feel like there's individuals in the house, and just as, a, like I said, as, as a congregation, we can kind of just assume certain things in our life have ended. And what I'm getting at is that because Jesus is alive and because he lives, you can actually have these kind of things. Does that mean your life is perfect? Not really. You're thinking, okay, David, I wanted an F-150 wrench, whatever edition. Is that what they're called, ranch editions? No, hombre. Man points, completely gone. King Ranch, there you go. I meant that, I was just testing y'all. So F-150 Ranch edition. No, you wanted that? That doesn't mean that Jesus is going to give it to you just because you want it. But, but I can say this, the things that are inside your heart, that your li- make, your feel life, make, make, make your life feel incomplete or without hope, those are the ones he's very good at dealing with. Not just stuff. It's the stuff on the inside. The, the hopelessness on the inside that he's very good at dealing with. So you can imagine what I'm getting at. The angel was sitting on it. You, you, you were thinking, I wanted to be rich, but it didn't work out like I wanted. I'm a little poor than I was. <laughs> and I'm having trouble making ends meet, David. Does that mean that the Lord's going to give me just a million bucks? Probably not. But he will give you this. He'll make you content with what you have. You'll be content. You won't be chasing after it like you used to. Well, I lost a relationship which was very near and dear to me. And this person completed me. They love me just as I am. And they're gone. Okay. I'm not saying he'll, that person will immediately come back. They might because Jesus is a very good restorer, by the way. He's very good at this. But even if they don't, your heart can still be complete because it's in Christ. You can still be living in fullness because of God himself. See, so the door can be open again. The desperation, the lack of hope where we feel sometimes as if our life is kind of just caught in this cycle can be opened again because Jesus is alive. See, now I could finish the lesson there. You know, if I finish the lesson there, it would be a pretty good lesson, I think. Man, maybe. Maybe. Uh, You know, you're thinking, okay, David, all right, well, my life is, I'm struggling with this, this, and this. I I lack hope. I feel like when I wake up in the morning, I'm just going through the motions because I lost this and because I don't have that and because I don't have that. And you're telling me that, you know, it's possible to change it. Yeah, it's possible to change it. Okay, cool. Happy Easter. I'm on my way to barbecue. But I'm not done yet. There's more to the story than that. See, the funny thing is that did you notice the power of the moment, right? Like the earth shakes, the, the stone is rolled away, the door is brand open again, and the angel says, what you thought was closed is now open. And it's a tremendous sign of authority, right? And the ladies were like, wow, this is amazing. By the way, that wasn't Jesus. That was just an angel. That was just the messenger of the gospel, not the gospel itself. This is just the guy Jesus sent. The power is just an angel. It's just a messenger, just like me. Today, I'm just a messenger, I'm telling you what happened, but I'm not the one that did it. You see the difference? The one who did it is somewhere else. He's not in the grave anymore. Let's let's really keep on digging here and see where he ended up. Uh, Verse Matthew Matthew 28, verse 8 and 9 and 10. Let's read this. So the ladies are there. They're kind of chilling. And they they freak out because the thing is open. What they thought was dead is now alive. They go and peek in there. They're like, okay, he's not there. Thank you, angel. Don't hurt us, right? And then they head out to follow the angel's direction, 
And look what, look what happens here. This is amazing. Pay attention to this. This is crazy. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, who met them? Jesus himself met them and said, hi. Hi. I love this part of scripture, man. Let, let, let me just pause there. They looked up and they, they, they worshiped and they freaked out. He gave them some more direction. Let me move on. You can read the rest later. <laughs> this is so amazing. They're at the place where they think he is. The angel says, he's not here. Go check. Now go and tell the disciples what you saw. They're walking back to see the disciples. And on the same road that they're walking, Jesus is standing there just kind of waiting for them. And they illustrate, I said hi. Jesus is like, hi guys. Hi, hello. Hey. <laughs> and you guys might think, no, he doesn't talk like that. The word greetings that he uses is basically good morning. Basically rejoice. Good morning. How are you? You imagine this? They went to see something that was closed and is now open. And then Jesus himself, the author of the miracle, shows up in person and says, hi. How are you? This is a warm welcome. You remember what I titled this lesson, right? Open graves and warm welcomes. This is a warm welcome. And this is the most important part of the lesson. The most important part of the lesson. I feel, and I'll be honest with you, I feel like there's a lot of people walking around nowadays with a lack of hope. Because things have ended. Because there's regret. Because things didn't work out the way we wanted. And then all of a sudden I'm telling you that the grave is open. And that what was closed doesn't have to stay closed. And you're thinking, yes! But that wasn't the whole story. The rest of the story is that on the path that they were walking, Jesus himself shows up and says, hi. This is the most important part of this. This is what separates a regular Easter service and just another Easter weekend from the most important Easter weekend of your life. This isn't just about realizing he's alive. This is about meeting him and walking with him, personal relationship with him. He says, hi. For me, I'll, I'll, I'll get close to wrapping up here. Let me wrap up the service and, and, and encourage you on this. For me, it looked in, I mean, I think everybody's unique, but it looked in, in a different way. You know, for me, I was a young guy. I, I wanted certain things for myself. I wanted, to have a, I wanted to have some money. I wanted to have a family. I wanted to be liked. You know, who doesn't like to be liked, right? I wanted to hire these things. And I remember early on in my, I said this the first service. I hope, I hope you understand what I'm getting from. I'm trying to show you my walk. I was a young guy, and, and before I was a husband, before I was a pastor, before I was anything, I was just a guy who had a, li- a lot of low self-confidence. Uh, I, I, I couldn't do what I'm doing now, but I would just faint. <laughs> like, like, uh, like, I had low self-confidence, I was kind of gangly, like I, I, I didn't, like I was tall, and like basically this tall and like maybe 120 pounds. So like I was a stick. And I had like really, my, my feet went like further than they should, right? And I was like, a, looked, felt like a clown. <laughs> and like, honestly, like, I'm sharing too much information, you know, grace me. This was, this was when, I, like, when I was a teenager. And even though it sounds silly to some of you guys, and maybe you're thinking like, whatever, dude. Like, honestly, in those days, the devil got, got, got a hold of my mind. And he started telling me that, that nobody would ever like me. That nobody would ever love me. That I was just awkward and weird. And, you know, you're just kind of weird shape. And... Like, nobody's really going to like you. Anybody can relate to that. And I remember feeling that way. And, and, and to me, that, that felt like a closed door. I would see all my friends doing their thing, going out, you know, engaging in relationships. And I was just kind of by myself all the time, kind of alone, or reading a book in a corner, that kind of thing. And I felt like a closed door. I felt like, you know what, like, I guess this is my life and this is the way it's going to be. It seems silly now, but honestly, when you're in it, it doesn't, it doesn't feel silly, right? <laughs> it doesn't feel silly. It feels like suffocating. And I, I didn't have that value. And then I thought it was just a closed door. But then the Lord started showing up in my life like he does. And just like the angel, he didn't like knock the door open. But it's almost as if the Lord kind of just unlocked the door from behind. He said, son, the door's actually unlocked. You're waiting there for it to open by itself. Caught in that cycle of shame. Caught in that cycle of grief because it never got better. When the whole time the door's actually been unlocked. Like it's, that's why I came, Right? I came so that you could have life and life abundantly. So you could be miserable or without hope. 
So over time, the Lord showed me that it wasn't about what others thought about me. It was about what he thought about me. And then eventually he sent me a wonderful woman named Sel, who you saw earlier. <laughs> now, <laughs> points for me, right? Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> he sent me a woman, Sel, and honestly, like, it sounds cheesy, and I use the same illustration over and over again, but the closest thing in the relationship that I have to God is my wife. Like, the love that I feel for her is not, like, and I'm not, this isn't a boast. This is what I'm trying to get at. What I, I thought I wanted and what the Lord knew I needed are two different things. I thought a closed door looked like this, and the Lord said, no, son, the door is actually open. And what I'm going to do with you, David, is I'm going to give you a full heart full of love, compassion, and care from your creator to you. I'm going to make you complete just with me alone. <laughs> And then whatever you have outside of that will come from my hand as a blessing. Then all of a sudden, my wife shows up and like she transforms my life. And I know that God sent her. Even though I made fun of that whole soulmate thing. <laughs> I know the Lord had her for me. And then all of a sudden, like maybe I wanted a bigger house. Or maybe I wanted a ranch so I can have my ranch edition truck, right, or whatever. And I wanted this big, massive thing. <laughs> and I didn't get any of that. And I thought, oh, that's a closed door. And the Lord said, no, actually, it's open. You don't need any of that. Wherever you are right now, the fact that you're there and the fact that your wife is there, that is a home that I will blossom your children in. Who cares what it looks like on the outside, son? You see the difference? Who cares if you're driving around in a minivan? I know what you need. And now my life has become a life of open door. Do I have everything? No. I still drive a minivan, like I said. I still have debt. I still have issues. My body still occasionally creaks and cracks. I still have all that, but I do have the one thing that I need because I, I met him on the road out. And he said, hi. David, come here. Good morning, son. Walk with me. Walk this life with me. See, this is what Easter is about. It has nothing to do with just the grave. We get caught up in that, and, and not, not that there's anything wrong with that. Of course it's important that the grave is open, but it's open for a reason because he's still walking around, right? Like, he's still alive. Like, he still does his thing. Like, he still connects and walks us and guides us in all that he does. And he says, son, you... <sighs> See, and I, it hurts the heart of the Father just as much as it hurts mine to know that there's people in this auditorium standing by a door hoping that it will eventually open again living with regret. If I had just done it differently, if I had treated them differently, they might not have left. If I had spent my money differently, I wouldn't be in the situation I'm in. If I had raised my kids differently, I would have blah, 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 blah. And I'm not trying to diminish any of that stuff, but that's a closed door. When we serve a God of open grave. And he says, no matter where you are, and I'll wrap up with this church, no matter where you are, I hope you hear me this morning, no matter where you are, he reminds you, your hope was not meant to end. Maybe you were just placing it in the wrong thing. First Peter says, because of the resurrection, we're now called to a living hope that's alive. And we don't walk around with regret thinking everything is ended and we'll just kind of wait till we die. No, our future's in front of us because God said the grave is empty. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to pray with you guys as I wrap this service up. Before I get too far into the prayer, I want to just talk to those individuals who are in the house today. Maybe you're here for the first time. Maybe you've been visiting us for a while. And in this moment of clarity, you're here. And, I, and if I were to ask you flat out whether or not you have a relationship with Jesus, whether or not you've made him Lord over your life, whether or not you've met him on the road, if I were to ask you if, you had, if you've made that decision in the past, your answer would be no. You'd say, I think I've believed in it in a way. My parents did, the, the church that I grew up in, blah, blah, blah. But if you're in the house today and you cannot answer that question with a yes, then that might be you. Maybe you're in the house and at one point you did follow Christ. You did make him the Lord of your life. You did have a relationship with him, but then life did what life does. Like I said a minute ago, doors started closing. Punches started coming in. 
and you've walked away from him thinking that the door that was closed meant that he wasn't good. Thinking that the life that was lost meant that God wasn't good. Thinking that the person that left meant that God wasn't good. Maybe you walked away from him thinking that the door defined him, but today I want to remind you that it wasn't the closed door that defines our king. It's the open grave. So if you're in the house and you walked away from him because of some circumstance, and today might be the day for you to come back and receive that invitation, good morning, hello, welcome back. If that's you, or you've never accepted him, can you raise your hand for me today? Nice and high, you've never accepted Christ before, want to make that decision to come back. Anybody else? Nice and high for me to see. Nice and high. This is the, I'm, not, I'm not in a rush. This is the moment why I'm here. Nice and high. Praise God. Anybody else? Okay, you can put your hands down. Church, I don't want these individuals to pray alone. If you raise your hand to come back to Christ, to accept him for the very first time, I want to remind you that I'm going to walk you through a prayer. We're going to pray with you, but this is not a special prayer or a unique prayer. This is a prayer giving voice to something that's occurring in the spirit and in your heart. I pray that you make this prayer yours because scripture says what you believe in your heart and confess with your lips, that leads you to salvation. So everybody in the house, nice and loud, supporting our brothers and sisters, repeat after me. Father God, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you that he died for me. At this moment, I ask that you come into my heart and that you save me. Wash all my sins away. Make me brand new. I receive you as my Lord and Savior in the name of Jesus. I thank you that because of my confession, I am forgiven. You live in me and heaven is my eternal home. I am saved. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Let's give it up for them, church. God bless you guys. Happy Resurrection Sunday.